four, only four, with maybe two extra ones sprinkled in there, but four of what I think are like 20 to 30 takeaways from this book. And you guys know me, I love books that are written by people who actually know what they're talking about. And this is one of them, right? When I read mindset books, I like that they're Harvard psychologists or ex-Navy SEALs. When I read a negotiation book, I don't want some person that just like did 10 real estate deals and tried to teach me how to negotiate. This guy is the real deal. His book, I think the subtitle, or maybe it's in the first chapter, it says negotiating like your life depends on it. And that's what his job was. He was the lead hostage negotiator and kidnapping negotiator for the FBI for over 20 years. And he was in that position when shit hit the fan and things went wrong and they had to completely rewrite the entire negotiating playbook based on emotion and empathy instead of bulldozing people and trying to win. Well, no, not negotiate at any cost, right? So we're gonna go through that today and I'm gonna try to do these four takeaways a little bit slow. Some of you who've been hanging around me for a while may have heard these, these four concepts before but we'll definitely do a part two and a part three of this because this book is loaded. If you could go out and spend $15 to make every conversation for the rest of your life easier, I would recommend buying this book, ebook, audiobook, or if you're like me, like a paper copy. I'll also say, I'm gonna share a couple of quotes out of the book as we get started, but I was going through my, I have a, I'm an e-reader, my phone's over there, but so I, I like iBooks or whatever. I highlight so much stuff, like I'm a note taker in books, as I was skimming through it, this must be one of my most highlighted books. I'd say 25 to 30% of the entire book is highlighted as I'm scrolling. It made it so easy to help me make this presentation today. But that's a lot of value in this book. He also was just on the Lex Friedman podcast. Although if you read the book, you will get a lot more value because they're talking like, you know, off to the left and right and up at 30,000 feet. The book is the goods. Um, but the podcast was great too. They kind of retouch on the issues. He's got a great YouTube channel. He's got videos that are specific to our industry in real estate and dealing with your clients, dealing with transactions. Um, after retiring from the FBI, he started a consulting group that teaches people how to negotiate for a living. Okay, uh, coming up next week, I'm really excited to talk about meditation. Uh, it's probably the single biggest mental health tool I have in my toolkit. And it's really simple. It's like the literally the easiest thing you can do, but I think there's a little bit of a stigma around it or what exactly it is. So I'm just gonna walk you through what it means to me and how to do it. Um, as, as easy as putting a five minute timer on your watch or if you wanna get into like home and have sounds playing and stuff, all that's available, right? Um, and then we're gonna go really tactical the week after on this call, uh, on this recording about writing winning offers, making sure that as we're getting a client who says, I want that house, we get them that house. And in this market, that means getting them at the right deal and probably a lot of negotiation, not just writing the top offer with no conditions, right? And our in-house meetings, Thursday, good friend of mine, Ryan Hodge is coming down. We met very early in the business. He's been a great inspiration to me. He owns multiple brokerages down in the London Woodstock area. He's also a keynote speaker and a coach. He's written a book. Uh, he's gonna come down, sit here with us on Thursday this week. Please be here, uh, excuse me. My shake is burping up today. I'm gonna to have to edit that out. And then we'll be back uh, the next week. I'll be at the Buzz Conference. Might see some of you there. Uh, and then we'll be back in house with our monthly market stats meeting. So it's gonna be a busy next couple of weeks. Uh, I just put the finishing touch on my keynote here. And I also wrote a two page article for this. And then I just got asked to do a follow up hour and a half Zoom webinar on the same topic. So it's gonna to be a month of talking about my own mental health problems. This is great. Uh, but that's hopefully this stuff can help you guys. So. I'm excited, I'm, I'm gonna try to make it down as early as possible on this day. My wife's coming with me too. Um, I haven't been a conf to a conference in too long and so I'm excited to get some inspiration. There's a huge lineup of speakers and then the afternoon you can pick which room you're going to. So if you haven't been there uh, to a conference or anything and this is the one you wanna go down, let me know if you're on the Zoom and you're coming, text me. We'll try to meet up and uh, meet in real life instead of just on Zoom, that'd be awesome. And a reminder, I just spent a good hour and a half last night catching up. If you do want any of these session recordings, they are all now up until last week's, which Daniel's getting me today. Um, they are all on the Agent Pro app. You can download that. And they're also going up on my YouTube channel. So if you want to, it's starting to become quite the library. Um, there's like almost 10 sessions now here and you can have it at your fingertip. You can hit download so you can watch them offline. If you're in a, going on an airplane or something, you want to listen to me for four hours, be honored. <laughs> okay, back to the topic of the day. I believe everybody should have a copy of this book, not just 
not just real estate agents, but everybody. I first got introduced to Chris Boss by my friend, Carrie White. Her brokerage, the original agency down in Brentwood, LA, um, they brought him in as a guest speaker. And she was like, she texted us from the presentation going, holy shit, you guys gotta get this book right now. It was like, it was 2016 when the book came out and nothing like it had ever existed before. I have old negotiation books, they suck, right? They try to tell you these four mindsets and you're gonna come in like the bulldozer, or you're gonna meet in the middle and it was all this cheesy crap. And this guy's book was like way off, like nothing anybody had ever heard before. And when a guy who for the past 20 years of his life had to deal with people who had a knife to someone's throat or a gun to someone's head and, or they're holding hostages at a bank, that's a different negotiation than you and I deal with on a normal day, right? And so he's become this amazing speaker, huge influence in all our careers. And I use this stuff every day. I love with the kids. Yeah, totally. Um, not against my wife, with my wife. We negotiate <laughs> things, right? I have to negotiate with you guys a lot in conversations. Um, I pulled out a couple quotes right out of the first chapter, just to frame this conversation up. Our techniques were the products of experiential learning. They were developed by agents in the field, negotiating through crisis and sharing stories of what succeeded and what failed. It was an iterative process, not an intellectual one, as we refined the tools we used day after day, and it was urgent. Our tools had to work, because if they didn't, someone died, right? This is like, second paragraph of the book. Later, he says, it turns out that our approach to negotiation held the keys to unlocked profitable human interactions in every domain and every interaction in every relationship in life. And this is how the book works, All right? So this isn't just talking about getting 500 bucks off a deal. This is about having constructive conversations, bringing people to agreement, not necessarily always getting what you want. Sometimes you're gonna have to compromise. If you get really good, you only have to compromise this much if you want, right? or you just slow down and take your time. But most of our job is trying to get what our clients want on their behalf. That's what an agent does in this world. And so you can't always compromise. If your client says, get me that house, James, your job is to go get them that house. And if you don't, you're gonna be labeled as the failure, right? So this is really key in our career. You know, we deal with people on the other side that don't seem to wanna to get a deal done, even though it's always been obvious to me in this career that we only get a paid if we get two people to agree on something. Doesn't it seem like a lot of real estate agents don't wanna do that <laughs> at the time? So sometimes we gotta be the negotiator for everybody. It's like the other client, the other agent don't, doesn't even wanna negotiate. We gotta get everybody on the same page. We gotta keep everybody calm. Today, I'm gonna to go over four techniques to do this. The first is called mirroring. The second is called labeling. The third is all about turning things around and mastering the art of the no. I already see Jamie smiling, he likes this one. And then the fourth is the summary, which is actually one of the key little moments in a really good conversation or negotiation. Before we get into these, the first thing I wanna talk about, I'm gonna to try to do it right now, is that a really good negotiation should be calm and slow, right? You're not gonna beat anyone by racing them to the finish line. In fact, the person who's more calm and doesn't feel the time pressure usually tends to win. If you can put time pressure or have the other person need to act quickly, right? You give short irrevocables or you're like, I got another deal coming in. You got to get back to me in an hour. There's all these little things we can do, but we don't want to be doing that to ourselves. This is the key difference. So we want to be the one acting calm and slow. We're going to take our time and get this done properly. And people will respect that, right? They'll want that energy from you. Um, there's this assertive bully kind of tactic that tends to be the dominant one, especially with older males in our business. If any of you are on the call, right? You know how long I've been in the business? You don't know what you're doing? Take it or leave it, right? This is our final offer. You hear a lot of these things, right? You're like, give me a break. You've been in the business long enough. You're like, those words just don't even register anymore. You're just like, okay, keep talking. Let's get to the point here, right? We wanna get past this assertive bully thing and we wanna be calm and friendly and know that we're all working together. Everyone wants to get a deal done, right? In the book, they calls this, uh, we're not gonna go into this, but he calls it using this like playful voice and then the FM DJ voice is these two voices. There's a third one called the assertive voice, which he's like, recommend hardly ever using. It's like a zero on like usefulness in your toolbox. But most people use it 100% of the time. They call up with this like, I'm gonna get this done, right? So just remember, being calm, slowing things down is on your side. 
I know for people, uh, sometimes when you're younger in the business too, it can feel like, oh my God, everything's happening. It's so exciting. Let's go, let's go. The best thing you can do is not reply. It's just leave people hanging for a little bit. It's just slow down, right? Make them come to you. Okay, let's get into technique number one. In the book, he calls this a Jedi mind trick. We've talked about it a little bit in some of our trainings before, but I'm gonna go over it again. The reason that mirroring works is because it develops empathy and respect in a conversation without the other person even knowing it. It has a subconscious effect of saying, I've heard you, keep going, right? There is no disagreement in mirroring, right? Imagine you're in a negotiation and the, the thing the person's looking for is where do we disagree? But if I just repeat the things that you say to me, the person's like, okay, we're all of a sudden we're coming onto the same page. So mirroring is as simple as repeating the last one to three words that the person just said. This is a great stall technique too, if you don't know what to say, right? You don't know what you're saying yet, you just, uh-huh, okay. I wish I had some examples. I'd need to role play with somebody here, but we've done this before. But someone's like, oh, so I need a house with two bedrooms, three baths. You're like, three baths. And then they, they're like, boom, Michelle's listening. I can keep talking, right? There's no disagreement. There's no adversarial moment. And you can do this with your client or the other agent. Remember, when you're talking to another agent about a deal, the more that they're blabbing, the more you're winning in a negotiation, right? You should be giving up very little information about your position or your client and gathering all the information about the other person. Um, the key thing here, I scroll my notes, that uh, Chris Voss talks about is that we fear subconsciously things that are different than us and we trust things that are the same. Does that make sense? We, we like to hang around similar people who like similar things. We like to go to similar situations. As soon as things get different, we get anxiety, we get fear, we get stress. So what's the most similar thing you can do? Repeat, right? That's the most familiar and similar thing. The thing I just said just got repeated back to me. Now, I will warn you that this sounds really awkward when you know you're doing it. You're like, I'm gonna get busted. <laughs> it's not gonna happen though, right? It, it flies over the radar because they're not thinking about it in that way. I have some friends, so my, my one friend, Carrie, who actually introduced me to Chris Voss, she's so good at this, I have to tell her to turn it off when we hang out. Like I went down to Miami to hang out with them last year and we were talking and she was in full real estate mode and she was just mirroring everything I said. I'm like, Carrie, stop, we're friends, okay? She's like, oh my God, right? let's just have a conversation. You don't have to mirror and keep me, uh-huh, uh-huh. So I'm gonna challenge you to practice this. This is amazing. I use this with my kids all the time. They love it. Carson's not in his head, he's a dad too. You know, as a parent, sometimes you're like, oh my God, what are you talking about, right? Can I please have something interesting to me? But instead I'm like, oh yeah? And then what do they do in Roblox, right? Oh really, the Gorgamon or whatever my kid's talking about, you just hit them up and they just keep going and keep going. You're like it's literally like you could be off in space as long as you can hear the last couple words before they pause. Now, I will add a little note here. Sometimes the last few words don't totally make sense. So what, you might just be pulling out a little piece of the phrase near the end of the sentence, right? Don't go repeating a whole sentence. This is literally one to three words and then zip it. And you get the right responses. They, they hear, I heard, they heard what I said. I'm gonna keep talking. I'm gonna keep going, right? Keep people talking. Anyone use this actively? I know I've taught it before, but have you purposely, Carson's not in his head, Ryan's not in his head. I yeah. Like I sometimes do it when I'm not paying attention to, and I'm like on the phone, but like I'll hear one word and then I'll say it just to pretend that I'm listening, which is really bad. Saved. Yeah. But it's better than uh huh, right? Yeah. It's so much better than yeah, uh huh, right? If you can just get the one or two words, it's going to keep things going. So really try this one out. This one. Has, the other thing Chris Voss talks about in this book is if you want to try these techniques all the time in human interaction, right? The next one really important. I reread the whole chapter on the next one, labeling. And he's, he's like, I'm trying to do it with strangers all the time. You walk up to someone at the coffee shop, try to see what their emotion is and call it out. And if you get it wrong, you just go opposite, right? You'd be like, hey, it looks like you're having a bad day. And the person's like, not really. He goes, oh, just a normal day? And he goes like, yeah. He's like, now we're friends, right? I, got, I, I pinged in his emotion. So you can play these little games in a low stakes situation so that you're ready to play them when you really have to and your stress is high, right? You want it to be an ingrained little part of you. Okay, the next one 
we might have not talked about in a training here before. It's really powerful. So labeling is actually part of what they teach in meditation. It's uh, part of what I'm reading in one of my favorite uh, emotional intelligence books right now. We want to be able to label somebody else's emotion, right? So meditation and, the, and these things, it's about labeling what I'm feeling. But if I can label the situation you're in, we have instant rapport, right? Like, Michelle, you look stressed, right? Now that's not the way we want to do it because it's a little too harsh. So Chris gives us these better words, and I have them here. Three of them. We want to remember these. I put the first one because it's the easiest, but it seems like, the second is it sounds like, or the third is it looks like. Now these are very soft, like, let me just throw this out here with a test, right? It's not harshly labeling it, like, you're being rude, right? But it seems like you don't really want to get this deal together. <laughs> James, James is smart. I love, I know when I, this is great. I love that you're like, have this stuff in practice. Yeah. So you can use this in a positive way or to like poke a little bit, right? It seems like you're not really interested in making money, right? It seems like you're not going to live up to your commitments this week, right? It sounds like you're upset, right? So it, you, what you're doing is you're, it's a test label, right? And you're going to throw it out there. And then the person's either going to go, yeah, you got me. You get me, you understand me, you just identified my emotion and now we can be friends and we can talk about it, right? If you don't get me, how much of a collaborator am I gonna be with you? If I'm here pissed off and you're like, well, Jeff, do I have a deal for you? I'm like, I'm gonna strangle your neck, right? So, seems like, sounds like, looks like. Again, this is gonna feel awkward if you do it because you know what you're doing and the other person doesn't. You're like, oh my God, they're gonna be like, don't tell me how I feel. Right? No, it never works that way, right? If you phrase it up right, you know, hey, you seem upset, right? You seem stressed. I use this one with my kids all the time too. Sometimes you'll get a, you know, a, a bounce back answer. Like, ah, I'm fine, right? This one from my other book is like, hey, how are you feeling? And then someone's like, fine. They're like, how are you really feeling? And you're like, whoa. That second question hits hard, right? It's like the, the, you get below the surface. So the key with doing a label is you gotta drop it and then shut up. You need at least a 10 second pause. If you fill the gap, you're not gonna get any feedback, right? It's making sense? Seems like it. <laughs> Seems like you know what you're talking about. You seem engaged today, right? So labeling is a really powerful technique. Remember, if you do it right, what it does is it builds instant rapport and empathy. Because when the person knows that you understand their state, then they're ready to hear what you have to say. You're on the same emotional team. This is really important. You're never gonna win a fight with someone who you're on separate emotional teams or they don't feel like this person doesn't even get me. They don't even understand what I'm talking about, right? Uh, when I was running my brokerage, I had to deal with cleaning up a lot of other agents' problems. So when a client gets angry and they can't get a resolution from you, then they would call me. And I'm like, okay, it's not even my problem. But the first thing I would do is sit down and I'd be, hey, I'm here to listen and understand what you're all about, right? Tell me the story from your point of view. And then I zip it and let them go and go and go all the way. Tell me the whole thing. And I go, whew, if that happened to me, I'd be twice as pissed off, right? I'm just, whoosh, let me come over to your side of the table for a bit. Now they're like, this guy gets me. All right, now let's talk about getting it fixed. I was watching another video this guy was talking about. Uh, he worked at a tailor shop and this like crazy irate lady came in and she was like, somebody, this button fell off my coat. And like, he's like, you know, you get all defensive. And he's like, I saw the manager just snap into customer service when he walked out. He goes, who sold you this coat? Do you remember what they looked like? This is unacceptable. And he grabbed the coat and he's like, boom, problem solved, right? He's like, if you can match the other person's emotion, then you're all on the same team. But if you try to tell an upset person to chill out, anyone ever done that by mistake? Hey, calm down. <laughs> what, is, what happens with the calm down, right? Whew. Yeah, you double the negative emotion. So this is what labeling's all about. Now, if you get the label wrong, then just flip 180 and go, oh, and do the other side, right? Until you get it right. But it's a test, right? By using seems like, sounds like, looks like, you're not committing to it. You're just, hey, from over here, this is what it seems like. This is what it sounds like. This is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm hearing. Drop the label and shut up. Okay, 
My absolute favorite, this one has been used. Some people are slowly learning it. It's getting out there. But a lot of stuff in this book still, as I encounter people in our industry, it's like nobody's ever read this and no one's repeated this book. It's like still a very secret thing even though it was written in 2016. We're all afraid of this word no, especially as salespeople, right? I hear it, that's why people don't like prospecting, that's why we don't like door knocking, that's why we don't like to ask questions in a certain way because if they say no, we're stuck. We don't know what to do. So the key here is actually just reversing our language around so that no is actually a yes. Does this make sense at all? I always have trouble with this one. Yeah. Right. It seems like you're ready to walk away from this. <laughs> so basic people, basic negotiators, we're always trying to close with a yes, right? But what you want to do is flip it around so you actually, a no is a commitment. So it's like, is there anything stopping us from just getting started? Is there anything preventing you from just signing this deal. If we get the right price and the right marketing strategy here, would there be anything stopping me from putting a sign in your yard? So the, the way you flip it around, it's gonna feel fearful too, because you're like, what if they say, yes, there is something stopping me. It's still, I'm still in the same spot. But the difference is no is like a period on a sentence. If they say yes, then they're gonna have the explanation ready. You go, oh, why, right? It's a lot easier to go that way. But the no is so much easier because people, it's easier for them to say no. People don't want to say yes because it feels committal too, right? So is like, is there any reason you can just start using this today, Michelle? <laughs> no, she says. <laughs> don't be afraid of it, right? A no can actually set up clear boundaries and give you options. So even if you don't reverse it, don't be scared of a no. This is the first thing is leaning into the no just know that no is not a finish line. It is for anyone in a basic sense. But if you get a, a no to a straightforward question, you just got to be curious, like you're surprised by it, right? So it's like, hey, are you guys ready to get started? And they're like, no. You're like, oh, weird, how come? Right? You don't think, ah, <laughs> I'm like crippled by the no and I have nothing to do, right? You just act surprised and curious and ask for the objection. But the advanced way is to actually flip it around. And if you say, is there any reason we don't just get started? And they'll go, they're short-circuited because they don't have a reason, so they have to say, no, there isn't, let's go, right? Now, if they say yes, you go, oh, great, what's, what's standing in your way? Let's talk about it, right? So no actually being a yes is a very, very powerful tool, and there's a whole chapter on this. It's a little more nuanced than we can get into in five minutes. But again, try it. Think about it, right? Uh, with the spouse, is like, hey, would it be ridiculous if we just watch this show tonight? <laughs> Are you opposed to another episode of Game of Thrones? <laughs> right? uh, it's, it's really powerful stuff. Uh, an, an interesting one, uh, I got a few examples here. When you're calling on the phone, a really simple example of this, right? Is now a good time? You know, some people, you can, hey, Carson, yeah, great. Is now a good time to talk? And they're like, instantly, they can give you a no, and what are you going to do with that? Oh, okay, can I call you there? Click, right? You flip it very subtly to, did I catch you at a bad time? And if they say yes, they're gonna, in their head, they're having to make up a lie about a bad time, right? It's, it's too quick moving. So they go, no, you didn't catch me at a bad time. Great, here we go, right? Little subtle ones, right? Ridiculous is another one uh, that people add into the no question. Would it be ridiculous for us to get started? Would it be ridiculous for us to write an offer on this property, right? Would it be ridiculous to just say yes to this deal and move forward? Because it wouldn't be ridiculous. You see what I'm saying? It might not be exactly what we want, but it's not ridiculous. So they're saying no to the word ridiculous, and you can move forward. Again, don't use these tools for evil. We use them to move people towards their goals, right? And I have yours here, actually, James. Have you given up on finding your dream home? Right? When your client's deflated, match their emotion, they look, pff, hey, it seems like you've given up, right? Have you given up on you know, making this happen? Have you given up on home ownership? Like, no, I haven't. Well, great, let's get back out there then, right? And we can turn things around really quickly. I love, my, my favorite close ever since I read this at the end of any presentation, buyer presentation or listing presentation, I close with, do you see anything stopping us from working together? You get the no, 
and you turn the contract around, right? It's so simple. If you get the yes, you talk about it, and you go right back in the loop. All right, now that that's taken care of, do you see anything else stopping us from working together? And they go, nope, you go, great, let's get started. Really, really simple. Okay, next one. I've been teaching this to uh, Riley as he's been learning to be the ISA. Really important part of doing a qualifying question, but it's also how you know you're at the finish line of a no negotiation. Remember, your negotiation could be getting your listing contract signed, writing a deal, getting a deal firmed up, all these things. It's called the summary, and in the book he talks about these are two magic words that if you hear them, you know it's over, right? If you've done your job properly, the other person is gonna give you a, that's right. That's right means you totally got me, you heard everything I need to hear, I'm ready to move forward. That's right. You want this word like so into your brain like it's a fire alarm. If you hear it, it's over, stop it. Just finish the deal, right? But to get to a that's right, we usually have to do a summary. So a summary is a little grand finale. You know it's kind of one step before the end of any negotiation. You can do it with another agent, right? Okay, I've heard some of you do this on the phone, right? So if I can get my client to come back at you with $420,000 and remove their home and financing condition, we're gonna have a deal, and they go, that's right. Boom, done, right? Get it signed, get it over to them. Stop talking, right? We don't talk past the that's right. So we don't wanna do a wrap up. The way we teach this on the qualifying conversation, it's like, hey, let me see if I got all this right. You guys need a three bedroom home, you've got 500 grand, you got 30 grand down, whatever, da, 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 da. If I can get you this and we can get you moved by the end of the month, you guys be ready to go shop for a house? Yeah, that's right. Perfect, let's get started, right? Now the thing, don't, don't be afraid to try the summary early because if you miss the summary, they're gonna tell you what you missed, you see? This is again, this is this slow down thing that I don't need to get it all perfect. It's not a little dance and they're gonna hold up a card like you're a figure skater. Congrats, 9.9, .9, right? They, you can do this all throughout the conversation. Hey, let me just make sure I got all this. And you repeat back the summary to them and they go, yeah, fuck, Michelle gets me. This is awesome. No one's ever got me before. So you've ever got it or you missed something. Um, the other one is we can add a label in here and now we're not labeling their motion or they're labeling the situation, but we can say, so it sounds like if da 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 plus this, plus that, we're ready to buy a house, right? If I can get you the home listed on the market this week, we can get my videographer out here and book the home stager, you guys be ready to get started? Yeah, let's go, amazing, right? So that's right, it's the perfect little word, but you're gonna get a yes or you're gonna get a head nod, but if you hear that's right, you know you've made it. Okay, this that went by really quick, oh my gosh. Last tip of the day. And we'll, go, we'll summarize these up really quickly. Very important to my younger people in the business, right? Whoever needs the deal more loses in a negotiation. Now who needs the deal the most in a, in a negotiation? The buyer or the seller? Usually the more broke real estate agent, just saying, right? They're the person who needs the deal the most. And so remember that, that if we can sense that the other agent needs the deal more than you, more than either the buyer or seller, you're probably gonna be in for a nice, slow, calm negotiation that's gonna go your way. We wanna operate from a world of abundance. If you are the person in a four-person negotiation, two realtors and two clients, if you're the one person that needs the deal the most, it's gonna be very painful for you. It's gonna be an emotional roller coaster, right? You gotta be willing to be detached from it. So what I've tried to do my whole career, first step, detaching myself from the negotiation, right? I don't need a deal. This isn't a hostage negotiation. My kids aren't kidnapped in a foreign country. This is just somebody's real estate transaction, right? I would love for it to come together, but I don't need it to come together. That's gotta be the attitude I start from. But the second thing is I'm trying to think in advance of how do I keep my client in that position, right? If your client just makes a firm offer unconditional on a buy, with a one month closing date, they're gonna be pretty tight on the first negotiation that comes in to sell their house in a slower market, right? They're gonna be feeling stressed and on a roller coaster, right? So we wanna to try to do everything we can to keep our client in the position of needing the next deal as least as possible, right? We wanna keep them calm, keep them relaxed. If not, if you notice the other person needs the deal, you can calm right down. Right, you be like, you get a little piece of information that they've already sold their home or you just, whew, that's the call I'm not returning for 60 minutes or three hours, right? Let them sweat, they're gonna be freaking out. They're ready to take anything you can send them. 
This is why we gotta be a little more mature and try to float up a level above the negotiation, right? So in all those parties, you wanna be the person, you want what you, this is the counterintuitive thing, you want your result, but you don't need it, right? That's the attitude of the winning negotiator. Okay, let's review our little tips from today. Number one, slow things down. You gotta be calm, right? Don't call anybody back in a heightened state don't text people back, don't email them back. Get people on the phone when you're ready to talk and slow down, hey, I wanna hear you out. Let's go through our options, let's talk this through. That's our biggest asset. You don't need to rush, right? Next, the easiest way we can start to build trust and rapport with people is a little technique of mirroring. Don't use it every sentence, please. <laughs> but you drip it in there. When you need a little more information, you don't know what to say next. You wanna acknowledge that the person's been heard, right? Next, our goal of all that mirroring is try to identify the person's emotion. If someone's excited, right, you guys seem really excited about this house. We are, great, let's make an offer, right? Hey, it sounds like you don't really want to go through with this. Yeah, you're right, okay? So we can use it to properly label an emotion or we can throw out one that we want them to disagree with, right? I taught one of my coaching clients once, they were having a problem with their team member and I said, hey, when you get in the next meeting with them, throw this out. I said, it seems like you're not really interested in being successful in this business. I see what they have to say about that, right? They're either gonna agree with you and retire, or they're gonna go, no, 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 right? You, you got me all wrong, and then we're in a conversation. All right, so we can either label it properly or label it improperly on purpose and see what happens, right? So don't be scared of either option. You know what to do. Three is start to master the no, don't be afraid of it, right? Be ready for the no. If, you, if the no you think means no, just act surprised and curious and try to find out why. You know, that's the confidence. It's like, whoa, why would they say no to that? That doesn't make any sense, right? I'm really confused. I'm curious, why, why aren't you ready to get started? I'm curious why you wanna let this go over $500. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me, right? Tell me more. But if you can reverse it around and start making no's yeses, it makes it really a lot easier for the person to say no, which is a yes, right? It's easier for them. There's been too many slimy salespeople that are trying to get you looped in. You ever had one of these people call you and you can tell they're leading you to a yes? James, would you be interested in doing more deals this year? And you're like, shut up. I know where you're going with this, right? What if that same person called you and was like, hey James, I just had a quick question for you. Would you be opposed if I sent you over a couple extra leads a month, no charge? I'm like, I wouldn't be opposed to that, right? Now, now you're thinking, now that you've learned this, you're like, okay, what's the catch? It's coming. Yes. This guy knows what he's talking about, right? <laughs> Now, the last point here, second last on this slide, is the summary, right? This is one I see a lot of people miss. We're trying, we think, we think we're at the finish line, but you actually haven't uncovered everything. So you go for the finish and they still have this big gap of not being understood, right? So always do a test summary. It's a test close, you'll get the that's right and you're done, or they'll tell you what you missed, right? This is a part of the slowing it down. Think, okay, I gotta summarize this up, loop this up. Hey, I wanna make sure I got all this. I wanna make sure I understood you properly. Last but not least, for you, be willing to walk. You don't want that as your result, right? You wanna win, you don't wanna walk. But the person with a plan B and plan C usually wins the negotiation. The person who only has plan A is gonna feel pushed up against the wall. So part of our job of being slow and calm is thinking the what if. What if this doesn't come together? What are my clients gonna do? What am I gonna do, right? Do I have a big enough funnel and pipeline? Do I really need this deal to come together or I'm not paying my bills this month, right? Okay, hope you guys enjoyed this quick little lesson. I would love to do a book study on this book if anyone's down for it, like chapter by chapter. Um, we gotta squeeze some time in for it though because I know everyone's busy, but this thing is the Bible. Go out and buy it today, all you on the Zoom too. Um, Amazon link was in my invitation to this. So for 15 bucks, this is like a $50,000 education. Go read it, highlight it, and use it. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. See you guys Thursday. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs>